Welcome everyone to this week's edition of the Extracellular Vesicle Club. This is an event of the International Society for Extracellular Vesicles. And my name is Kenneth Whitwer. I am the Chair of Science and Meetings for ISEV. Um, and this week we have uh, two co-moderators of the event who are going to introduce our speaker and the very interesting topic that we have to discuss today. Um, before I turn it over to them, I just wanna remind everybody to please put your comments and questions in the chat box during the presentation. And then at the end, um, our co-moderators will, uh, will, will, will uh, present your questions, will go through your questions, and we will allow you to unmute as well at that point. So our co-moderators today um, are people who are not too far away from me geographically. Um, and uh, so one of them is, is uh, Uta Erdbrugger, who's a professor at uh, University of Virginia, and, um, and also Luca Musante, who works with her in, in the group. Um, Uta is one of the first people that I met with, with ISEV, um, I think at the first annual meeting that I attended. Um, and we had a really great conversation around her, uh, around her poster about characterization of individual EVs. Um, and so Uta has since become the treasurer for ISEV. Um, and so I'd like to hand um, this over now to you, Uta and Luca. Thank you so much for helping with the club today. Um, and I will, um, I'll leave it to you. Yeah, thank you very much. I hope you can understand me. Um, it's really a pleasure and an honor to be here today and I'm really looking forward to discuss uh, Ananda Kuguratsky's paper. I hope I pronounced your name properly. I'm really excited um, to hear it. It was recently published in Nature Cell Biology and the title is Quantitative Proteomics Identifies the Core Proteome of Exosome with Synthesis 1 as the Highest Abundant Protein on the Putative Universal Biomarker. So, Working with EVs, um, it's really clear that this is a very pressing and important question. So uh, knowing a universal marker would really open up a lot of discoveries. So I'm, so I'd like to jump into the, uh, this, uh, to the presentation very quickly, and then uh, really looking forward to the discussions. And uh, I, I will try to um, catch all the questions, but if not, uh, send us a second message or so. So Luca and and they will help me so that we can find your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you again, Fernanda, for coming. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to present here today. I'm um, going to start with uh, sorry, a very brief introduction on extracellular vesicles. So their extracellular vesicles are membrane-enclosed uh, particles that can be classified as apoptotic EVs which are in the larger range of size that varies from approximately 100 to 5,000 nanometers in diameter. And uh, they are released by apoptotic cells. Then we have microvesicles that are from um, 100 to 1,000 nanometer in diameter and they body directly from the plasma membrane. And finally, we have the smaller ones that are called exosomes or small vesicles, small extracellular vesicles. And their size ranges typically from 50 to 150 nanometers in diameter, and they originate from the endosomal compartment. So exosomes uh, contain different types of uh, biomolecules, including proteins, nucleic acids, uh, metabolites, amino acids, and they are involved in intercellular communication through the delivery of these cargos or via engagement of receptor-mediated signaling in targeted cells. So um, the field of exosome has traditionally used uh, several proteins as um, exosomal markers, and these include the tetraspanins CD9, CD63, and CD81, and other proteins such as flotillin, HSP70, HSP90, Alex, and PSG101. So our work um, started when we decided to characterize exosomes that are released by different cell types that comprise different origins. And in this uh, mix, we have epithelial, mesenchymal, T lymphocytic, B lymphocytic, and monocytic cells as uh, origin. Uh, so the exosomes were produced in cells that were growing in serum free medium. And we checked the viability of, of the cells to confirm that they were um, high. There was low levels of apoptosis upon serum starvation. And then we isolated the, in this first part of the work, exosomes using ultracentrifugation. And then these exosomes were um, characterized by nanoparticle tracking analysis, transmission electron microscopy, and they were also, uh, we, we verified the levels of the tetraspondin CD9, CD63, CD81 using flow cytometry of exosomes bound to beads. 
So I'm just gonna briefly show you here the characterization of these particles. So we observe that the, the, uh, the, the size range varies in the range that is uh, known to be for small extracellular vesicles or exosomes around 100 nanometers in diameter for all cells um, evaluated. And the, their morphology um, is a cup-shaped morphology that's also in the size typical of exosomes that's determined here by TEM. So next, uh, we used this uh, beads assay where we bound exosomes to beads and then we stained them for an isotype control, CD9, CD6, CD3, CD81. And then we uh, analyzed the levels of this uh, that respond by flow cytometry. So in each of these histograms, I have the isotype control compared to CD9, CD63, and CD81 for these 14 cell types. And here in the heat map, we have the quantification of the percentage of positive beads. As you can uh, appreciate here, there is um, the, uh, a very heterogeneous, heterogeneity in the levels of these tetrasponins. And we were surprised to observe that certain cell lines have the levels of the, for example, CD9 in HP and EG, Cap and Raji is comparable to the levels of the isotype control is basically negative in this assay. And for example, CD81 was also uh, not, uh, not detected positivity in the XPC3 cells. So we then asked the question, um, is the low levels of this tetraspinins at the surface of the exosomes uh, reflecting uh, the expression pattern in the parental cells? And to answer this question, we used the qPCR to quantify, uh, to characterize the transcript level of CD9, CD63, and CD81 in these 14 cell lines. And for that, we also designed two distinct uh, primer pairs for each tetraspinins to have a more robust uh, evaluation of their transcript levels. And um, in fact, we observed that uh, CD9 had the, the lowest uh, uh, expression levels in HP and EG, Cat and Raji, as we observed by the BEADS assay. Uh, CD63 had the lowest expression in Jerkat and Raji cells, also observed here in the quantifications. And CD81 had the lowest um, expression levels in the, X, uh, in the XPC3 cells, as shown here. So um, it seems that uh, the levels of these uh, proteins at the surface of the exosomes is mirroring the expression pattern in the donor cells, in the parental cells. And we also then uh, validated our assay specificity um, by using uh, exosomes that were generated by cells that have been silenced for CD9, CD63, and CD81. We confirmed that the, the downward relation of this transcript by QPCR, and we characterized the exosomes that were released by those cells by uh, NT analysis. And then we conducted this staining as in the beads assay, and we observed that upon silencing, in fact, we can detect a decrease in this uh, tetraspinins. Just uh, therefore, we validate the, that the antibodies are specific for this tetraspinins, and the assay is um, sensitive enough to detect fluctuations in the levels of these proteins in the exosomes. So having this observation, we ask, we ask the question, what would represent an ideal exosomal marker? So thinking about it, uh, we came up with two uh, requirements. And we think that an ideal protein should be detected in exosomes from distinct cell types, should be ubiquitous to exosomes, and also should be abundant in exosomes from different cell types. So that would, um, would make a very robust marker for the defining exosomes. So uh, to uh, uh, discover these proteins in an unbiased manner, we employed a mass spectrometry-based proteomics. And to obtain an accurate quantification, we used the SILAC-based quantification. So SILAC is a metabolic uh, labeling method uh, where we grow uh, cells in a culture media that contain heavy labeled amino acids. For example, my control sample will grow in the media contain light lysine and arginine, and my test sample will grow in a media contain heavy versions of these amino acids. As protein synthesis takes place, the cells will incorporate these labeled amino acids. And after approximately five cell divisions, you have a full labeling of these proteomes. And then what we do is to quantify, lysine and quantify the proteins and mix uh, an equal amount of lysates from each 
sample of interest. And in this way, all the subsequent uh, steps of the workflow are performed simultaneously. So this will allow for a very accurate quantification because uh, if you lose sample from one sample, you lose from the other one in the same way. You always have an, an internal standard inside your sample. So all these steps of sample preparation, digestion, fractionation, purification, uh, nano LCMS are performed with the samples that you want to compare simultaneously. And then you can distinguish the light from the heavy labeled peptide by the shift in the mass to charge ratio in the spectra. And uh, as opposed to label free quantification in proteomics, uh, where you have the control and the test samples in every step of the workflow being uh, handled separately, and you only combine them in the data analysis step. So for example, in SILAC, you would detect the, the levels of these peptides are similar, the light and heavy labeled, and then in label free, they would be uh, running completely different runs, basically. And here I would have a down regulation, for example, of this peptide and an up regulation. And that's how we, we detected the change in protein abundance using SILAC in comparison to label free. So, the advantage of SILAC is that since you do everything combined, you have a very accurate protein quantification and label free uh, proteomics, you can introduce variability in each step of the workflow, which will give you a less accurate protein quantification. Uh, one of the advantages of this uh, direct SILAC comparison is that it allows for up to three samples to be compared because you have three types of labels. You have light, medium, and heavy while label free, you can compare an unlimited number of samples. So what was done then to um, harness the power of SILAC to do multiple comparison, there was developed the super SILAC method, where you basically label a mixture of five different cell lines, uh, at least five cell lines, and then you make a super SILAC standard mix and you can combine that to different samples. So you always have a, an internal standard. And in this way, you can run unlimited number of samples because all of them will be compared to the same internal standard. And this method was shown to be superior to using only one cell type as the standard, as shown here by the distribution of the ratios that was more narrow and uh, most of the ratios were within this five-fold range. So super silic can then be applied to study uh, human tissues, cell-derived material, and mouse-derived material. And then, we uh, combine super silic with the MaxQuant platform for data analysis, MaxQuant and Perseus. So in the end, our work, in our workflow, we have exosomes that are light labeled. We collect the three biological replicates for each cell line. And then we have a super silic heavy labeled standard. And then um, before the mass spec uh, sample preparation, we combined uh, five micrograms of each silic standard and five micrograms of exosomes. We perform in solution digestion and then analyzed by mass spectrometry. So once we got this data, we then went back to our question, which proteins are then detected in exosomes from these distinct cell types, which are ubiquitous to these 14 cell types. Uh, so a brief overview here, we could uh, quantify approximately 2,000 proteins in each cell line. And we found that uh, 1,243 proteins were common to the 14 cell lines analyzed. And some proteins were uh, identified uh, specifically in, in, in one cell type. And this, for example, we found that the B cell markers and T cell markers were identified only in Raji and Jerka, for example, showing that the, the, the method was able to capture the specificity of each cell line, but also the, what is the commonality among them. We then use this string to conduct a protein-protein interaction and uh, to evaluate the gene ontology category and uh, enriched in this um, cohort of 1,243 proteins that were common to all the cell lines. And we found a very a highly interconnected network and an enrichment in categories related to extracellular exosome, membrane-bound vesicle, vesicle, uh, uh, nucleic acid binding, um, and metabolic processes. And when we compare uh, this um, set of 1,243 proteins common to the 14 cell lines, to the proteins that have uh, human proteins that have annotated uh, are annotating exocarta, we found around 90% overlap. 
shown that the majority of these proteins have been previously identified at the protein level in NR deposited in exocarta. And these are the common proteins to the 14 cell lines. So on our next question was, uh, which are the proteins that are consistently abundant to these exosomes? So for that, we then um, filtered our data in a sequential manner to capture proteins that are more or less abundant in this um, all the exosomes evaluated. And our criteria was that we require, for example, for class one, that the silic ratio was higher than four in at least two out of three biological replicates for all the cell lines analyzed. Class two would be higher than one, silic ratio class three, zero, eight, and so on. And in this way, we can have highest to the lowest enriched in all cell lines evaluated. And we were very surprised to observe that from the commonly used uh, markers, we only could uh, pinpoint here TSG101 and uh, Alex in all the cell lines analyzed using this criteria. For the other frequently used markers, we can see here that the, the, the abundance is, uh, varies a lot in the different cell lines. So we also use the, this data set to uh, look for proteins that are also consistently depleted in exosomes from different cells. Uh, for that, um, we filtered our data set out again, lo looking for low abundance proteins. And we could identify the calnexin, that's a commonly used exclusion marker and also several other proteins, predominantly nuclear proteins that were low in abundance in the exosomes of all cell lines analyzed. So because the different methods, exosome isolation method can uh, provide differences in yield and uh, in purity of, of the isolations, we validated our first observations with UC using two different isolation methods. Uh, here starts with density gradient. So basically we load exosomes in the bottom of the uh, optocraft gradient. Uh, we uh, centrifuge 15 hours, uh, 120,000 uh, Gs. And then we collect six different fractions and each of, uh, sorry, 12 different fractions, exosomes in general, they float in the top fractions and so forth. And then we, we washed each of these fractions separately and analyzed them by Western block. So here are the results. We did this analysis for three different cell lines in three biological replicates. And we observed that the majority of these uh, exosomes were found from fraction one to fraction six for these uh, lines. And these fractions were then pulled, washed, and analyzed by supercellular mass spectrometry. Uh, another method that we used was uh, based on size exclusion chromatography. So we used the key QEV columns. We recovered 25 different fractions using an automated fraction, fraction collector. And then we performed uh, NT analysis of fraction 7 to 25 for three biological replicates for three cell lines. And we observed that uh, exosomes were predominantly found in fraction 7 to 10. Um, we then concentrate these fractions that we call exosome rich, that's seven to 10, and exosome depleted, that is 11 to 25, using um, filters. And then we analyze the exo rich and exo depleted fractions by Western blot. And here we have the results. Uh, exosomes were found uh, in the exo rich fractions, as shown here by Western blot. And then uh, these fractions um, were then washed and analyzed by supercellular mass spectrometry. So in this comparison, uh, we could uh, quantify 1,628 proteins that were common to the three methods in the three cell lines. There were more than 2,000 proteins identified in each cell line in each method. And uh, the overlap among the three methods in each cell line was approximately 70%. So each method, uh, the, 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 each method was able to capture 70% of this uh, proteome. So they, they identified them in common. And when we conducted a principal component analysis, we observed a separation that was mostly, uh, the separation mostly occurred based on the cell of origin rather than the isolation method which suggests that the, the, the cell of origin is the major determinant of the content of these proteomes. 
So we then use this data to look which proteins would be still uh, abundant and still depleted in the exosomes from the previous um, data set. And we observed that there were um, a, a, a cohort of 22 proteins that were is still uh, highly abundant, re, uh, independent of the isolation method, and 15 proteins depleted in the proteome of exosomes. And uh, in the cohort of abundant proteins, uh, we again use the string, conduct a protein front interaction analysis, and gene ontology enrichment analysis. And we observe proteins related to um, and enrichment and categories related to extracellular exosome, uh, membrane vesicle, plasma membrane, and also GTPase activity and RAS family, which are uh, categories that are known to influence different aspects of exosome biology. And among the proteins that were consistently low abundant in exosomes, we found predominantly nuclear related gene ontology functions and a set of uh, high mobility group box proteins that are mostly related to DNA functions in the nucleus. So one, uh, one finding that really caught our attention in this um, data sets was the astonishing degree of enrichment of Centenin, Centenin 1 in comparison to the super silex standard. So um, here in the 14 cell lines using the UC isolation method, we found a high enrichment of Centenin 1 in the exosomes from all the cell lines analyzed. And we confirmed this enrichment using Western blot analysis. So here we have cells loaded and exosome lysates for each of the cell lines. And we probed for Centenin 1 and beta actin. And we see that Centenin is uh, more abundant in the exosomes, while beta actin is predominant in the cell lysate. And these also, we could observe a high degree of enrichment of centenin in the two different isolation methods for these three cell lines. And we confirmed that also by Western blood uh, in the optifract fractions and in the size exclusion fraction. So we also could detect centenin because it's an intraluminal protein. We use this beads assay and we introduced a step of fixation permeabilization to stain for this intraluminal protein. And uh, we, here we show basically the validation. If we use non-permeabilized exosomes, we do not detect centenin, while when we permeabilize exosomes, we can detect centenin by flow cytometry. While CD63 is detected in both because it's a surface protein. So we then uh, conducted this experiment for two different cell lines, exosomes, and we could find high levels of centenin in all of them by flow cytometry. And then we isolated um, apoptotic EVs, microvesicles, and exosomes from three different cell lines. And uh, we conducted uh, NT analysis, and you can see here the distribution of these particles for the MVs and exosomes. And uh, we probed for centenin 1 and Alex, which were predominantly found in exosomes, while beta actin was uh, found in the apoptotic EVs and microvesicles. We also um, looked into the presence of centenin 1 in other species. So we looked, uh, we isolated exosomes from uh, different murine cell, cell lines uh, 41, B16, F10, and MC38, that are cancer lines and fibroblasts and macrophages from mouse origin. And we could detect centenin-1 in um, all the exosomes analyzed. Uh, we also um, isolated uh, serum from mouse and from uh, isolated exosomes from mouse serum, from FBS, from uh, horse serum and goat serum. And we could detect centenin-1 in all the samples analyzed. Uh, we then uh, collected exosomes from 100 different uh, plasma samples from human donors. And here, just showing you the NTA profile of the samples very briefly. And we conducted Western blot analysis, and we could find centenium wanting all the samples analyzed for these 100 uh, plasma samples, uh, the exosomes collected from them by ultracentrifugation. And we also uh, conducted single particle analysis of centenin-1 in these exosomes. And we also detected uh, high levels of centenin-1 in comparison to the isotype control. 
So we also collected then uh, exosomes from urine from bladder cancer patients, and we could detect it also Sintana in those samples. So which uh, shows us that Sintana can also be detecting other species, different species and different uh, biofluids. So in summary uh, from this work, we identified a cohort of 1,212 proteins that were common to 14 cell lines and validated by three isolation methods. And these proteins potentially comprise what we call a core proteome for exosomes. And we identified 22 proteins that were consistently abundant in exosomes that we proposed that they could be exploited as uh, potential exosomal markers. And we identified 15 proteins that were consistently depleted in the proteome of exosomes, which we proposed as potential exclusion markers. And we also identified centenin as the highest consistently abundant protein exosomes. And we think that uh, given this high abundance of centenin, this should be, could be considered an ideal exosomal marker. So um, our findings, the finding that the findings that you have proteins that are preferentially enriched or depleted in exosomes may reflect key aspects of these um, extracellular vesicles of their, for example, biogenesis, bioavailability, and circulation, or cell targeting. And they studied of these proteins could inform the community about those, uh, enrich the, the knowledge about those aspects. And also um, our findings can potentially provide an improved uh, understanding of potential exosomal markers and exclusion markers that are based on protein abundance. And with that, I would like to thank um, um, especially Dr. Kaluri for the opportunity to work in his lab and also all the lab members, the ones involved directly in this project are listed here and everybody in the lab that has been really great. Um, also our collaborators, collaborators from the Advanced Technology and S Proteomic Facility at the Beetson Institute, uh, especially uh, Dr. Sarah Zanivan, and uh, uh, Ken from the High Resolution Electron Microscopy Facility that helped us with the TEM experiments, and also thank all the funding agencies. And thank you all for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Fernanda. This is... Uh really um, beautiful work. Thank you for sharing. Um, yeah, I think this is a very elegant approach to discover a universal biomarker. Um, and going from your discovery to validation, also to human samples. So I think this is a lot of work. I see that and it um, opens up uh, new opportunities for us. So I see the questions are coming in very nicely. And um, maybe I, I'm allowed to, um, start with the first question here. And, um, you know, I'm, my, my work started with microvesicles, microparticles, with the larger vesicles. So you kind of focused your discovery here on exosomes, you used the filter, and yeah, you checked also synthenin in the other vesicles, but wouldn't it make sense to also um, study larger EVs? I mean, in the end, I mean, you already did a lot of work here, great job, but I'm, I'm pushing already here at the beginning um, to find also specific markers for small and large EVs. So is, uh, am I asking too much? Um, yeah, that's a very good point indeed. Um, we did not do this analysis in this first study uh, because our lab mostly focuses on uh, in small EVs, but I think this approach to using a Silex standard would be great also to identify markers that could be used for larger EVs. So I think it's something very promising. Yeah. Okay, so um, let's see. Um, and the second question I have, and then I, I let everybody else here. Uh, I'm also uh, interested in um, how constant the, this marker expression is. You know, that will be interesting. I'm a kidney doctor and we have housekeeping proteins or uh, in steady state, for, um, for example, creatinine. Uh, depends on the, the body uh, muscle mass. And um, so if we want to study and, and use this as a housekeeping for how do we know that it's constantly expressed? You know, I saw the, the Western blood of all the human samples and I saw differences. So it's different for each individual, but what about one individual? Yes. Yes, I also think we run into the, here even for cell lines, some cell lines have higher levels than others. But I would say that always the baseline is already really high. 
So is at least uh, here uh, in log four silic ratio at least like sixteen fold enrichment in the in the cells in the exosomes. Sorry, in comparison to cells. So I think this still needs to be done. The, the appreciation of how variable it is in different sources could be done, for example, by expression, analyzing the expression levels and trying to correlate with protein levels. But I agree with you. It seems that also in the plasma samples, it's variable, it's different. But the, the, our point here is that we can detect this protein in all time that we analyzed in the in different sources, while other markers that have been used in the past don't seem to be that universal for different origins. At least this protein, we think it's there, you know, that's okay. that point, yeah. Uh, thank you. So let's see, there are so many questions. So let's, let's uh, start working on those. Um, so um, there are some technical questions, um, but also questions, um, how much, a lot of questions, how much uh, synthamine one is uh, also quantitatively in plasma exosome. That was one question. What is the percentage of synthamine one in plasma exosome? Can you comment on that? Yeah. And maybe I can add the second question comparing with tetraspanins, how much more is synthamine one expressed on exosomes? Maybe you can ex answer those questions together. Yes. So when we look at the plasma exosomes by single particle, we could identify if I use a percentage of positive around 50, 60% positive in comparison to the all population of exosomes. And uh, pertaining the cell, the cell type. Sorry, I'll just go back to the slide. So for example, these are the levels, abundance levels of centenin one in all the cells analyzed. And these, for example, are the levels of CD9 in this first line. And you can clearly see here how um, heterogeneous CD9 is in comparison to Centen 1. And uh, for CD63 and CD81, we did not detect those proteins in all the cell lines analyzed by proteomics. And that's why they're not in this heat map. But CD63, uh, CD81 was not detected in one of the lines, and CD63 in several of the lines, which might be due to the fact that CD63 is. Um, heavily glycosylated, and that can prevent it, uh, the identification by mass spectrometry. Okay. I also want to say, so if I don't um, uh, represent your questions well here, please, uh, everybody has a chance to unmute themselves and ask more questions for Fernando. So please feel free, otherwise uh, um, mute yourself. So um, I see another question um, from Juan Falcon uh, Perez asking, do you have an idea of why sentinel one is in the exosomes? What will be its physiological role? Exactly. So I didn't discuss in this presentation, but sentinel one is a protein that uh, participates in the biogenesis of exosomes. So there's, um, I would say, several very good papers showing the participation of sentinel one in the formation of exosomes in the uh, multivesicular bodies. So we think that the high, uh, the, the high abundance of centenin in these particles may reflect its role in exosome biogenesis. Thank you. I, I see um, Clotilde Thierry is here as well. Do you weigh on that as well, Clotilde? Oh, uh, yes, uh, <laughs> thank you, Uta. Yeah, no, actually it was more a comment uh, than, than a question. And I, I mean, uh, as, as Uta said, you have done a, a huge and very, very valuable uh, work as a resource, and that's going to be very useful. Uh, I hope all the data, uh, the, the raw data are also available. But my comment was that uh, all, all the EV isolation methods that you use, they co-isolate EVs from the plasma membrane and from MVBs. So I would... I would have refrained. I mean, I did not review your paper, but I'm, if I had, I would have asked you to change the nomenclature and to say that what you were analyzing were small EVs. So in fact, you identify um, synthamine as one of the, the major, um, uh, mostly uh, enriched proteins. So it, it suggests that maybe you, it means that the, uh, all cells um, possibly secrete at some level exosomes from MVBs. 
but you also identify like SLC382 or, uh, and I, at, at least this one, I know we have recently identified and published in a, another protomic uh, study that this one was uh, more uh, likely to be a plasma membrane derived EV marker. Mm -hmm. So that was <laughs> just a, a general comment. So I don't know if you want to uh, yeah. answer yeah. or say why you use the term exosomes uh, in the paper prominently. Yes, so, um, yes, we use the, I think it's more a historical, <laughs> um, like, uh, how would I say, we are used to use the term exosomes, but I agree with you, that would be better to use as small extracellular vesicles instead. Yeah, but then again, uh, in terms of centenium one in micro vesicles, uh, we don't uh, really identify them when we isolate MVs. We identify predominantly in what we call exosome or small UVs. So we do think yeah. it might be very specific for exosomes. For, well, for small UVs, it's true that Pascal Zimmerman's group is, is a result suggests that it comes mainly from MVB derived uh, uh, vesicles. But yeah, there is a comment from Esther Nolte too that on the same uh, line, maybe she can also. Yeah, if I if I could just jump in too, I mean, I think that the um the, the way that you separated your exosome fraction from your microvesicle fraction is really a kind of a um a definition that's based on the the separation method, mm -hmm. and you know so so you're right. I think historically we've always said if a, if it's a low speed, then it's the larger things. If it's a high speed, it's the smaller things, and that's that is generally true. But we find um I, th I think it's becoming very clear that there's a lot of cross contamination there. And there's a lot of other things um, that might be that might be present there. And, and in fact, as Clotilde mentioned, you also have very small particles that can come from the plasma membrane. And so, you know, I, I you know, I think we've we've made definitions in the past that have been based upon our assumptions. Um, and so, it, it, it's I think it's very important if we want to have universal markers of one subtype or another that we also we also identify like what is our contamination with the other uh, subtype. What is the possible contamination even with intracellular um, particles like my I, I mean I mean I think that from some of the results that, that my group has had it's clear that you know if you have a very small percentage of cell death for example in your population um, you can have release of these particles from the inside of the cell um, that are going to look just like an ectosome or an exosome um, by most of the methods that we use um, so so I think that you know it's 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 worth I think this is a great uh, great contribution here, and it's a it's it's worth following up on this to see you know what what we can say about the subtypes. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, yeah, I'm very much interested in that. Um, also, I also liked your data about the tetraspanins because I think we are all experiencing that. We everybody tests them and see it's it's uh, we sometimes they are there, sometimes not, and then depends on the top side. I think. George Taboul, um, and none of you had a comment here on, on that. I don't know if he wants to ask this question. Um, well, I didn't have a question. I was just commenting on Nelly that uh, we have a chip where we isolate EVs based on tetraspanins or other markers. And we've looked heavily around tetraspanin, uh, around syntenin, uh, co localization with tetraspanins. Uh, and basically, commenting to your comment uh, as to we do see syntenin heavily co-localized with tetraspanin vesicles uh, in, in different samples, either cancer uh, cell lines or MSCs, but there are subpopulations um, where you pull down based on another membrane marker and it will not co-localize with syntenin. So there is heterogeneity and diversity. Uh, but for the most part, when you look at tetraspanin positive vesicles, they they do co-localize with syntenin and kind of validates the, the work that's uh, being presented here. Thank you. Yeah, so I think um, we have also very technical questions, so maybe we can cover those as well. Um, I think um, Nali said, I have a couple of questions. After 15 hours of centrifugation step, will the exosomes retain their therapeutic function? Did you also observe in um, uh, mesenchymal stem cell derived EVs, do you find the same markers in exosomes isolated by PEC and other precipitation methods or combinations, I would add. Um, I was wondering if you tried even cleaner versions from plasma, for example. So from plasma, we did um, a, 
we did only three hours centrifugation, only a three hour because we noticed that we got a cleaner sample uh, as opposed to the overnight of the centrifugation. Uh, but we only used that method. We didn't compare it to other methods of isolations. Okay. Um, and then I think, Luca, maybe you can answer there were questions about urinary V. So I, um, I think you, you did a great job of looking already plasma, urine, different animals. Um, that's really uh, ubiquitous, but um, Luca, can you answer the questions? It's um, really your expertise about uh, adding, uh, preparing the UEVs properly for the proteomic analysis. It was from some data asked initially. Do you see the question? So the question was, um, is it indispensable to add BDT in the proteomic study of UEVs? Can this yeah, increase? I Mm. I think Fernanda was direct the question. THP did interfere with your uh, analysis. Uh, sorry, could you repeat, please? If uromodulin or tamosfal protein, that is the most abundant protein in urine, did it interfere with your analysis? So for the urine, we only no. probe for, for centennial one in Western blood. Uh, we did not probe for other proteins. Uh, it's here. So we didn't look at the contaminants or the abundant proteins in urine. We basically probed for centenin one in this case. We had also questions about the, the because we had cell culture where medium only control tested. Um, someone is asking, um, you included 10, 5% and that was dialyzed. Uh, the person is wondering if EV depletion was quantitative or if medium components might explain some of the overlap between the cells. You know, okay. there was a good overlap. I agree. Yes. So uh, all the exosome preparations that we have for small EVs, they were uh, conducted in serum-free media. So we don't have, um, we have not used serum to avoid the contaminants. And also for mass spectrometry, it's a much cleaner sample if we don't use serum. So we don't have all the contaminants from the serum in the exosome sample. So I don't know if that was what the question meant, asking about serum. That's how I understand it. Um, let's see. Yeah, comparing with tetraspanins, how much more thinning is expressed? Yeah, we already, I think we already- Yeah, that's true. That question. Um, Okay, I um I have I see um after size exclusion from um chromatography, why did you use flotillin one to identify these fractions contain EVs? Was yes. it also identified consistent between the different cell lines? Yes, so at that time we didn't have not concluded our study yet to come up with the better markers. So it was more like a, at the time we did this study, we this other isolations we knew. Uh, by looking at this data, for example, that uh, flotillin one, where is it? So it's here. So flotillin one it was very high in PANK1 MDA and in 293 cells. So we knew we could use that for that purpose. But at that time, we did not conclude this study yet to come up with the conclusion that centenin was the best marker. So and that's why we used flotillin. But later on, we run all these uh, experiments for centenin as well. And we could identify the same thing. And actually, we show that in the paper here. So we have centenin in Optiprep and also in size exclusion. Yeah, I, um, I was very intrigued um, that you um, found also markers on the membrane. You know, I, I think it's, uh, I'm doing a lot of flow cytometry, and it's more tricky when the proteins of interest are in the EVs, so you, you yeah. had to caramelize them. But um, so you found uh, this one marker um, in, uh, on the membrane. Do you think which one would be ideal for sorting? Because I'm talking a bit about future possibilities um, uh, because if we have a universal marker, we could finally maybe sort properly EVs, you know? And uh, do you think one of your markers could yeah, so, have you done anything in that way? Yeah, so we did some work on that, on the membrane, because of course they have more potential for uh, development of immune affinity methods and also detection by flow cytometry is a much more straightforward de detection. And uh, uh, we, we follow up a little bit on CD47 and integrin beta one. 
Uh, NCD47 actually was very high and very consistent in the cell lines and also in the plasma of uh, patient of uh, donors. So you can see here. And integrin beta one, again, here for 293, the levels were not that high. Uh, but in the, when we look at the, the plasma derived exosomes, we could also find a, a very high levels here. So, but I would say if I have to choose, I would uh, go for CD47 because I think okay. it was very consistent. And okay. also it's been shown to um, interfere with the bioavailability of exosomes, right? The, how they can be phagocytosed by other cells. So it protects them from phagocytosis. And this might be um, also a mechanism that um, promotes exosome availability in circulation. So I think it's a very promising protein. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm very excited about that. I mean, we, we all, uh waiting for that. I mean, it, it, your data also shows uh, that um, there is a variability, but um, this is, we always learn something new and now this is, this is a good direction, wonderful. Um, yeah, let's see. Um, um, yeah, have someone also wanted to know if symptom levels are proportional to the E count or change in response to experimental condition also in disease and health. I would add, I, I mean, I'm, we're asking too much right now. <laughs> Yeah, so actually Centennial 1, there's a lot of literature that um, um, shows that the levels are increased upon cancer. So Increased upon what, please? Yeah, in cancer, in several types of cancer, they show that there is an increase in the levels of Centennial 1. So it might be, yeah, there's a, a vast literature on that. So it might, might be related to that. And also some 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 works proposed to use centenin as a marker for cancer as well. And Luca, do you have some question? I see you getting ready. Yeah, uh, Dr. Falcon has a more biological question. What could be the role of centenin in exosome or small EVs? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, I think this, um, a role for uh, I've already established role for centenin one in the biogenesis of exosomes and how they are formed in the MVBs. So we think that might be the reason why we identified centenin consistently in these exosomes because of it's a biogenesis related protein, so it localizes there in the exosomes. And another question: Someone asked if you have explored some other target belonging to the RAS family, more specifically RAB11, that is ubiquitously expressed? So we did not pursue uh, other RAS-related targets, but uh, yeah, I agree that they would be very, very interesting to follow up, to do more functional studies, because we have a, a lot of them that came up as present in the exosomes from the different lines, but we did not, we did not pursue that at the moment. Uh, someone else asked if you ever ever tried to track synthenin after isolation with on precipitation based method like PEG or ExoQuick. Okay. No, I have not tried that one. Yeah. And do you think is this is my question? Being so abundant, can you detect synthenin? with the minimal processing of the sample. So you don't have to push the, the enrichment uh, so much to detect it. Yeah, I do think there is, um, that's, that's the advantage of using such an abundant marker. Uh, for example, I've done experiments where I loaded even a 0 0.1 microgram of uh, protein in a gel, and I can find a very strong signal for synthetic in Western blood. So it definitely helps that you don't need to load so much protein or that you don't need to purify so much your sample to detect them. Have you ever tried to, to check synthetic in the direct cell culture media or biofluid, urine, plasma? Uh, no, I have not done that. Okay. Oh, sorry, if I may jump in one more time, Fernanda. I, um, yes. I'm really impressed how abundant this is. Mm -hmm. And um, so I... I 
I like the first questions there, but I'm also, your data also confirmed that TSG 101 and Alex are also good markers. So yeah. uh, this has been our friend TSG 101, a very reliable marker, so you could confirm that. So um, I found interesting that other markers which we have been using were not as strong, throttling and some others. So, so yeah. you, I don't know, is that the detection method also? With the technical approach with your CLAC method? I'm not the super expert yeah, on that. Of course. So um, I don't think it's the, the CLAC method because you could identify them in higher levels in other cell lines, you know? Like if it were something specific from the method, we would not have identified them in certain lines. For example, you have here a flotilla that is high here, but is also low in these other lines. So I don't think it's a methodology problem here. I think they are really reflecting what the cell, um, what the, what we have in that particular sample in terms of abundance. All of these samples have been combined to the identical same standards. Okay. So all the quantification is uh, relative to the same standard. Thank you. Yeah, I um I, I see a fresh question here. Have you tried to check the presence of CD sixty three or AD one in small EVs using other methods such as Western blot? In the previous studies, these proteins were detected from these cells that you investigated. Yes, I I did Western blot with them, and That's actually so. we have a, a very very comparable results to what I find using the bees. So at the beginning, I think it, it really reflects this finding here. We did Western blot as well. Yeah. Yeah, so looking maybe at the end a little bit into the future. <laughs> um, so what are the next steps or, um, I mean, I see a lot of possibilities, um, but what, what do you think is really important? Yeah, so I'm very, um, I actually am very excited to study this um, enriched ab more abundant proteins um, in a functional level. I think that would be inform a lot about potential novel mechanisms related to exosome biology. And um, also you could uh, um, use these proteins uh, for better report, reporter models for exosomes, uh, identification of small EVs, for example. And um, I think also the, the exclusion markers are interesting in, uh, in, in their own merit because uh, apart from Calnex and all the, other, all the others commonly use uh, exclusion markers, they are not as consistently depleted in all the samples. So I think that cohort of proteins is also very interesting for that purpose. Um, I, um, yeah, I think uh, I'm also interested in uh, you know, you, other EV sources from organs once we do functional yeah. studies, yeah. Uh, how abundant is it in those likely similar that we don't know yet. Mm -hmm. um, and um, yeah, any other conclu conclusion remarks you like to do. We are very thankful that you have been presenting this. And thank you so thank much. You. I really appreciate the opportunity here. It was great to discuss with you all. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. Generated a man, many questions. Um, so we really look forward to your next work and functional yeah. studies, you said. Thank you. Can Indeed. Well, thanks, everybody. Thank you, Fernanda. Thank you, Uta and Luca, for co-moderating today. And to all of you who came out uh, to listen to this great presentation and to ask some good questions. So we look forward to seeing you again at an EV club in the near future. And please reach out to me if you'd like to, uh, to present some work or if you'd like to, uh, to serve as a moderator as well. So um, thanks again and take care, everyone. Bye Thank now. Thank you, everyone.